Hello, I'm Tristan Hughes, doer of all things ancient history at History Hit. And today on the YouTube channel, I have come here to the site of Kalkriza in Germany because this was where archaeologists have discovered an array of incredible artifacts belonging to one of the greatest defeats the Romans ever suffered, the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. Now I've got here a replica Germanic spear used by these warriors some 2,000 years ago. And today, we're going to be testing out some weapons. This does look pretty cool. Two swords, these swords, key weapons in the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. They were not specific for the Teutoburg Forest. They used them everywhere and their effectiveness was the same here as anywhere else. And for a Roman, was the sword their main weapon if you were a legionary and you were fighting in somewhere like Germania? Yes, the Roman legionary is described as a swordsman, but he also had uh, his spare, the pilum, um, which probably was much more effective and much more important than the sword. So which one here is the Roman sword that we're looking at? This one is the Roman sword. Okay. And first we'll look at that scabbard with the gems and everything. Is this, this, it's beautiful. Can we imagine scabbards being like that? Yes, this is a replica of a Kalkrisa scabbard. So uh, the gems and the silver fittings have been preserved here. So this is actually a reconstruction of a Roman scabbard yes, discovered mm -hmm. during the Teutoburg Forest ambush. Yeah, wow. at least the scabbard. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't find the sword, sadly. Oh, okay. So what, what does it look like? Come on. So it has a two-edged blade yeah. that is a bit narrowing in this part and that getting wider and then ending in a very long and pointy point mm. that is quite thick in the end. And it's symmetrical and also has a symmetrical handle. This uh, sword is optimized to stab against armored opponents. So this long and thick point is able to penetrate armor, for example, to penetrate chainmail armor and to get in between the um, plates of a segmented armor. But wait, that's, that's Roman armor. So it's designed to pierce Roman armor. <laughs> yes, basically it's uh, optimized against an opponent that is um, equipped the same as the Roman army. And also it's quite short, but it's quite, it's, it's quite well balanced as well. It's, yeah well designed for a sword and also is it quite easy let's say during those opening bouts in the Teutoburg forest you're surprised the Germans are charging towards you would it be quite easy for a Roman legionary to get this out from their side? Um, the sword would be quite easy they can get it out and it as it is quite short it is no problem in a forest or anything else. So the iconic very central pommel there on the Roman sword this caught my eye because it looks so different if you don't mind me of course and looks very, very different too. This isn't a Roman sword. No, it is not. It's a Germanic sword. Here you go. So talk us through, what does this mean? How is it designed? What is its main purpose? It's a typical Germanic sword for the time um, shortly before or of the uh, Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. This is a one-edged sword. Oh, that one there, yep. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. you have only one cutting edge. And so the grip might be or is asymmetrical which, by the way, fits better in human hand. That is asymmetrical too. It's quite wide, um, getting to a broader point than the Roman sword. If you can take yes, the Roman sword, the if we compare yeah. this, yeah. you see um, it doesn't have to get in that deep to get a very wide wound, right. whereas the Roman sword has to get in much deeper. And the second thing is that this very long pointy point tends to get stuck in, in wood or bones. Uh, whereas this one is easier to get out again. Which is also quite interesting, isn't it? If this is designed for fighting against heavily armoured opponents, and this is designed to fight against lightly armoured opponents or no armour, it always feels like a bit of a mismatch because the Romans are fighting lightly armoured opponents. Yeah. The Germans are about to fight very mm. heavily armed Romans. <laughs> yes, that's true. Military is, is very traditional, so probably they just used the swords they um, were used to and didn't change the design. The only thing is that the Germanic um, warriors uh, from the time of the Varus battle began using Roman swords, mm. but this is most probably not because they got used to um, armored opponents. Uh, it's just because it was easier to get a Roman sword than to make one themselves. Yes, yeah, so you can, when the battle starts, you couldn't imagine some Germans actually using a sword like this. It would still yeah. be swords like that. Yeah. And I also need to ask, about slashing. Typical portrayal of the barbarian is with a long sword slashing down. Yeah. Is that true in any way? 
I don't think so. The Roman sources always advise their legionaries to stab because it's better than slashing. Um, but they also write that uh, the Roman legionaries were slashing too. There are accounts of battles where they have cut off arms and so on. And um, the Germanic warriors or the barbarian warriors are set to use only slashing blows downwards. Uh, what I don't believe for several reasons. Um, the one reason is that most of them used spears and a spear is a, a thrusting weapon. And I don't know why they should invent slashing for swords when they used stabbing with spears. And the second uh, thing is, if I hold the sword like in my opinion I should, yep. this grip is very good for um, holding it as an elongation of the ah. arm. So it's very good for stabbing mm. and not that optimized for slashing. And you can imagine almost like a Roman legionary would have a shield in their left arm and is kind of thrusting forwards. For those Germans who had a sword, and I'm guessing those are perhaps the more elite yeah. of the Germans, would they have been better armoured? Would they have also had a shield as well alongside the sword? Yeah, um, Germanic warriors um, probably always had a shield alongside with the sword or the spear. Uh, it was a, a bit smaller than the Roman shield. And um, I think the main problem for the Germanic warriors was the different shape of the Roman shield and the Roman armor. So I'm a 27 year old guy who grew up playing Rome Total War and we've got these pretty sharp weapons in front of us. I've got to ask the question, can we give them a go? We can. When approaching this, I'm a complete amateur. Is it all strength as much strength as possible or is, is it very much technique? It's more technique than strength. Okay, well, you're the expert, so would you like to go first? I try to. <laughs> Straight through. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, oh, you cut right through there on that slice. It really emphasizes how it could cut if need be, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, armor wise or even human flesh wise, what does that represent? Uh, the Japanese say that this represents a human arm. And you're an expert. You've been doing this for many years. Yeah. This is my first go. So it's my turn now. It Wish is. Wish me luck. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That German's not walking away from that. Ah. I mean, would that be bone? Could that go through that bone? Of course. Wow. You wouldn't have thought that. It just shows how sharp they are. We have a Germanic spear back here. Yeah. I will handle it to you. Okay, oh, thank this you. This time. This is the German one, okay. This is the German one. Yep. And we have the typical Roman one over ah, here. Ah, the javelin, yes. The so-called pilum. Yeah, I think it's not just a javelin, it's also for thrusting. Okay. We have depictions where you see Romans uh, thrusting or using them as thrusting manner, not only throwing. And it's such an iconic design, isn't it? I mean, yeah. why do they construct it like this? You have this square, narrow point mm. that is armor piercing. So through plate armor, but also through shields. And this shaft is normally longer than a human arm. So it's probably designed to hit through shields and hit the person behind the shield. Even though it's designed to pierce armor, if you're one of those Germans running towards the Roman column at the beginning of the Bass of the Teutoburg Forest, and one of the Roman legionaries throws that at you, goes to your shield, you've already got the forward inertia, that is going to go through flesh as well. That is absolutely deadly. If it's deadly, it's not clear, but uh, at least it stops you. And the second thing is um, the side effect. You cannot get it out of the shield, so uh, it hinders you. It maybe bends and you cannot fight on with it in your shield or in your body. We usually portray these as being thrown by yep. the Romans. But if you're in a bit of a pickle, like the Germanic warriors running down at you, you don't have much time. If you can't get your sword out and you've got your pilum to hand, you could use an underarm as a spear. Yes, you could. And in my opinion, it's even better because it keeps the opponent further away than uh, using your short sword. So uh, I wouldn't throw my last pilum. I would use it as a, a stabbing weapon. Fair enough. Well, let's have a look then at the, the opponent's, the German spear. 
And this was the everyday weapon for a German warrior, wasn't it? So yeah. You get one-handed with a one-handed. You could you long. could can use it one-handed with a shield, and this uh, already has a quite um, large tip for a Germanic spear of this time. Large tip for a thrust. Oh yeah, and would it be underarm or could they also overarm as well if need be? Throw it. But yeah. You've lost your spear. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> and this is uh, the same reason with the Roman um, spear. I don't think that they would throw the last one because otherwise they are back to swords and uh, they have to get much closer to their opponent. Um, the main advantage of these things is you're, you may be further away from your opponent, mm. which is much safer, and you can adjust your distance much better than with the sword because you can grip it either here or you can grip it here. Ah. How effective would a spear like this have been against an armoured opponent? Not very effective. Not very. Mm. Um, this wouldn't pierce armour and uh, it wouldn't pierce shields. This is mainly f uh, of use against an unarmoured opponent. And Otastus wrongly, I think he says that there isn't any iron in Germany, which of course there was. But to create something like this, quite easy. You can see how they were mass produced by the Germanic warriors. This is a quite easy way, uh, easy thing to produce and you don't need uh, so much iron to produce it. This is the main difference uh, to a sword. And also, so let's say those first attacks by the Germans in the forest and they're coming down, they're descending on the Roman column. Some of the legionaries getting ready, they'll have their javelins out or potential spears. Do you think they would have had time to throw one of these or would they immediately have used them as a melee weapon? Throwing them is most effective if you have a free field and a mass of people coming towards you. Mm. That means in a, in a foresty uh, kind of place with uh, single people coming towards you, mm. it uh, would be more ineffective. Okay, so fighting in that very narrow environment in heavy woodland, keeping hold of your weapon, much more important than throwing it and using it as a missile. Yes, and the second thing is uh, it's, it's much more probable to hit a bush or a tree in a forest uh, than, a, than a Germanic warrior, so it's better to keep hold of it. You know what I'm going to ask next. Can we try these out too? We can. Oh, fantastic. What have we got here? What's this test dummy that we got here? It's just a simple board uh, where we can have some thrusts to and to compare the different sizes of the holes these weapons make. This is good against light armoured opponents. That is good against heavily armoured enemies. Exactly. And as always, it has the advantage against um, heavy armoured opponents and the disadvantage against light or not armoured opponents of making a smaller hole. How exactly do you do a spear thrust? There are two possibilities, the overarm or the underarm, and both work with uh, just throwing the spear but not totally letting it go, so throwing it Ah. and holding it at some point. Well, let's crack on with it. Would you like to go first? Yeah, okay. I will. It's quite a small point, isn't it, for the barb and everything on there? Yes, and you see there's only a very small hole. Yep. That means that it has uh, more force concentrated on the point, Smaller getting the through point. armor. Yeah. But uh, if you hit an unarmored opponent, the hole it makes, and so the blood loss, is quite small. Yeah. Shall I give it a go with this? Okay, I'm going for that side. Wow. Big a gaping wound there, isn't there? Of course, it, it went right through. It wouldn't go through a shield or through armor, but if you compare the sizes of the holes, and here you see the cut going to here. Yeah. So this is a big bleeding wound. Ah, oh, so that, that, those cuts either side is from that kind of a wider bit there. Exactly. Yes. And this, although very brutish against unarmoured or lightly armoured enemies, how effective would it have been against Roman armour? It wouldn't pierce through. Really? It would get uh, through a shield a few centimetres, but uh, not the whole shaft like with this one. So for Arminius and those who are attacking the Roman column, even though they've got the advantage of surprise, they've got the benefits of terrain that suits them, the weapons they've got still on the best for defeating this Roman army. They were not really good for uh, fi fighting an armoured opponent like the Romans were, yes. Wow, okay. This adds even more to the task that they faced. 
Having seen what kind of damage the weapons of the era could do, I took a look at another quickly developing military technology of the time, armor. Recruits Tristanus reporting for duty. Ingo, you've got your wagon full of equipment there. I've got my civilian tunic on. Let's go. The Roman civilian dress is a tunic usually made from wool. This is the first stage in Roman dressing, alongside my cingulum belt and my caligae, the famous Roman hobnailed sandals. So first of all, so this is Lorica Segmentata. Yeah. I mean, but this is a full example of the one that I've already seen at the British Museum. Exactly. This is our replica of the original that we have found here. Oh, of exactly the same armor? It is. All right, well, let's see if it fits. <laughs> it's exactly the same size, so... Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Nice. Here. Yeah. Looks very good oh, look at that. on you. The buckles of the surf and also some of the leather. So this is how, yeah, so this is how they linked all these different plates together. Yeah. Yeah. I must ask, for a Roman legionary some 2,000 years ago, would they have been expected to do all of this themselves or would have they had someone to put on their kit for them? I think they would have done it with their comrades, which, uh, which they were sharing a tent. It's very difficult to put on one of those by yourself. Yeah. And each legionary, they lived in almost a dormitory, didn't they? And those, yes. those close comrades, they were almost your, your very closest brothers in arms. They were your best mates in battle. Exactly. It feels a nice bit. And also, I could still move around quite a lot. Was this modern technology for 9 AD? It was. This was the most modern thing you can get, could get at this time. Before, legionaries only wore chainmail armor. And this was invented shortly before the uh, Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. And it was the newest thing you could get. So what comes next? Next, first comes your belt. Again. Ah, right, yes. To show that you are legendary. This is a symbol of legionaries, okay. and only legionaries were allowed to wear it. Ah, so this was a marker, almost, that you were a military man. Exactly. Now, I'm very excited for this. Of course, your sword. So this is my main weapon, is it? It's one of your main weapons. The pilum comes later. So you have one belt for your sword. Okay. Okay. and one belt for your dagger okay. and you're wearing them a little a bit crosswise yep. in literature up. called cowboy style cowboy style <laughs> okay what's next next comes aha belt. look at this Coming yes your head for me the iconic early imperial helmet is it a coil like that yeah it's not too big i'm not jangling it around it's not really impairing my vision at all so I can see, I can hear when I'm on the march. I've got this rim at the front, so I guess to, to protect against like slashing the sores and presuming. And then this massive rim at the back, once again, further protection from slashing weapons, it feels like. Was this better than Shemo? It's protecting a bit better against, for example, Pilar. It's not as um, breathing as chainmail armor, mm. and it's not as movable as chainmail armor. And the next thing is, for you, it fits perfectly. But normally this one has to be fitted to the body of the wearer, whereas a chainmail um, more or less hangs down and fits to every size and more body shapes of legionaries. Almost one size fits all. Yes. Almost. So this kind of feels the, the base. There is more to add to me to be a Roman legionary, isn't there? At least on March. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you want to be on March. This That's is like a so-called fulca. Fulca, okay. This is the thing with which Roman legionaries carried their, all their belongings. In here is your cloak. Cloak, okay. Here are your personal things in there. Yeah. This is your food for three days and you have to carry it over your right shoulder. Right shoulder. And that was standard, was it right shoulder, not left shoulder? You could carry it on either shoulder, but today you have to carry the shield. Ah, on the other end. okay. So what are these? These are your pila, your Roman spears. You have to carry them in the same hand. Okay. Three poles in one hand. One hand, yep. Maybe even four. Oh, what, really? Because sources differ if you carry two or three pila. Really? Oh, wow. Really? What else do I need? Of course, your shield. Okay. And would I always have my shield out ready here, or what, what was the usual? Normal on a march. Uh, through normal territory and you don't expect danger, you would wear it covered in a leather covering on your back. Okay. But this would take you more time to get it out. 
So now you're a Roman legionary on march in an area where danger is expected. Right. So if a Germanic warrior jumps out of the forest, you just have to throw away your Fulka and then you're battle ready. I must admit, I'm starting, my right shoulder in particular is starting to ache a bit. It's so much equipment to carry for yeah. one soldier, particularly all these three different poles, and as you say, maybe four. Now, the name Marius Mules gets thrown about a lot, and Marius, a statesman, very important general of the early first century and late second century BC. Why do the legionaries get the nickname Marius's Mules? Marius uh, saw a problem in the big baggage train of the armies of his time. So every leg legionary put his stuff onto a wagon or on a, on a mule and didn't carry it himself. And so Marius changed it so that every legionary was carrying all his equipment, his weapons and his food for three days so he could operate for three days uh, independent of his baggage train. If Varus has some 15,000 legionaries, he's got 15,000 Marius mules in his army. Yeah. It's going to make quite a lot of noise, isn't it, as well? This is going to be a very long, a very noisy, very visible army marching through the Germanic forests. You cannot really walk quietly in this equipment, uh, but the Romans, they want to be heard, they want to be seen, because they are here and they are the rulers. Well, I'm here, I'm in Germania, I want to be seen. Can I have a little bit of a walk? Of course you can. Okay. I mean, this path, it feels quite a nice path, but thinking 2000 years ago, I'm banging my head against the Ferka and my Pila at the moment. I can't imagine what it'd be like trying to get past these obstacles, whether it be like the small trees or branches, bushes and so on. That is also a really difficult task for a Roman legionary. If someone falls over, does the whole column have to stop? Uh, yeah, probably, especially on this very narrow path, one legionary that just gets stuck somewhere or several tumbled over him would stop the whole column and it would probably take a long time to get it going again. If there was word of an attack, if I saw warriors running down towards us now, how easy would it be for me to, let's say, get rid of the Furka, get my sword out, be ready for battle? It would take you some seconds. That means if you see the barbarians very late, it's maybe too late for you. Yes. But otherwise, you just have to throw off your Fulka and you take your pilum, for example, or your sword. The only problem is when you have thrown your Fulka into the swamp, you don't have to eat for three days. So probably after the first few attacks of Germanic warriors, the legionaries didn't have food anymore. Wow. All right, well, come on, let's go and have a bit more of a walk. Oh, it's heavy stuff. It's the right shoulder that's killing me. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.